A very good day to everyone present. Welcome to this webinar on heteroscedasticity and uh, how to fix it using R. I would like to start by introducing our presenter. Richard Wesson started his career by completing a Bachelor of Computer Systems Engineering with honors at the University of Technology, Sydney. Over the past 20 years, he has held multiple positions in both the private and public sectors, including research and scientific analysis and modeling at the CSIRO and UTS, software development at SEMA and MasterCard, data mining and analysis at MasterCard, SEMA and Interwoven, technology, business and management consulting at Interwoven and Vision 2 Solution. All of these areas have involved engaging in business analytics both formally and informally under the names of research, data mining, time series, trend analysis and prediction, web analytics, behavioral prediction and decision support. Richard's mathematical and statistics and scientific background combined with work in many, in and with many companies maintaining large data warehouses allows him to explain business analytics with a good balance of theory and practical application. He also has a black belt in Six Sigma. On that note, I request Richard to commence the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Austin, and welcome to everybody who's joined the webinar. Today we'll be talking specifically about understanding in terms of regression techniques and statistics when we're looking at data modeling and system modeling, a concept called heteroskedasticity or heteroskedastic situations, and then what we can actually do about them when, we, when they arise, because they do arise quite frequently. So a brief introduction of or agenda of what we're going to cover. There's really two major parts to this, or three major parts to this uh, webinar today that will take us over the next hour. First, I would like to look specifically at the, the situation and the problem with regression and where heteroskedasticity comes in. It's a bit of a tongue tie, tongue twister, that one. Um, we just get used to it in the statistics world. So we'll look at that in terms of how it fits, an introduction of what it actually is and how we recognize we have it. Then we'll look a little bit more as to what we can do about it and then what comes out at the end being the regression equation or the actual model that we're going to use to represent and predict things within our system. That's a, a very small subset of what would be taught and we would do much more detailed and, and um, discussion of theory and also some of the practical aspects of it in the master class that we will I'll talk more about that, what some of the areas and what's included and what you can actually do or what kind of rewards you might get at the end of that. And then I'll mention some of the batch of master classes that are currently scheduled for the month of February. And finally, talk a little bit about Edu Pristine, the company that I'm working with to do these classes and how I believe and why I believe that they are a good training partner for many professionals out in industry. So moving along, I'd like to start with saying, what is regression? I'd like to create some context around this whole concept of heteroscedasticity. Now regression, when we're doing regression, statistically what we are trying to do is find a relationship and quantify the accuracy of the relationship between one or many input variables and a single output variable that we're trying to model. Now the reason we want to create a model is to be able to make predictions uh, within our bounds about how something might behave before we actually have to go and measure it. A model can be of anything. It can be a financial model. It could be related to the stock market. It could be a system model related to something in manufacturing. It can be a model related to people's um, to training, so people's skills, what's been done, and the, um, the training that they get resulting to maybe productivity or resulting maybe business revenue or tied to whatever variables you want. But really what we're trying to do is identify that relationship and we're looking to determine if that relationship is a linear relationship, i.e. follows a straight line, if you might see a line that goes up or down, or if it's some other more complicated relationship that follows a quadratic or a parabola or any other kind of polynomial or, or curve that would best fit that. Because once we know what that is and with what coefficients and constants are around that, we can then start making predictions and trying to make that better and hopefully that will represent what we're trying to do 
in the real world. And this is what a business analyst's job and in business analytics, that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get information for decision support and then information about behavioral situations, making a model of it and then saying, if we, what if we were to do this? How would that behave? And using the model to help us answer those questions before we go and spend money. The two areas of regression that um, are most related to today's presentation, certainly not the only ones, but the most common ones are linear regressions, where a linear regression is where we have only one input and one output and some constants. For those of you who recall some high school days, that was written as y equals mx plus b, typically. Or multiple regression, and that's the example we will use today, where you have many um, input variables, plus many relationships potentially between them, so x1 may be related to x2, but still only one single output that we're trying to identify a relationship with and how that the weights of each of those factors, both individually and together, affect that. With that information, we can get a regression model. Now, in a great world, when the regression model works really nicely, we will usually get a result that shows something called homoscedasticity. What that's all about is there is a fundamental assumption in regression that we would like the residuals or the error and the magnitude of the error between a predicted value and an actual measured variable. So in this case, predicted y versus actually something we've measured and we have data for. We'd like that variance to be as constant or as close to constant as possible. If we do, we have a homoscedastic system. And if we do that, our regression model is finished. We don't have to worry too much about errors. Now, that sometimes happens. If it's a fairly simple system, we can usually find that. Though more complicated systems, things like economies, and especially in econometric modeling, are far more uh, susceptible and far more influenced by multiple factors. So heteroscedasticity is usually what we find. But this graph, I wanted to just to show you on the, the y-axis, it says error u. That's just the magnitude of the residual against the predicted y. So as you can see, the errors are about the same, and they're on both sides of the line. So it's oscillating around predicted y that can usually be attributed to either the accuracy of the model that is sustainable over a period of time or a, period, or a set of measurements, or noise. Both of which, though, are usually acceptable depending on, on the level of precision the model needs to have. It does, however, satisfy and respect the constant variance requirement or assumption for linear regression. However, if it all goes wrong, what we say is the constant variance assumption is violated or it's invalidated. In statistics terms, that becomes what's called heteroscedasticity or a heteroscedastic concept or system. Sorry about that word, it's quite a tongue twister. I've always had troubles with it. What we can see here is the same residual on the y-axis, error u, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but my point is there. And then as to the predicted y over time, we're seeing the values changing significantly. Now remember, these are not measured values. These are the error and the difference between the actual value measured and the value predicted by the model. So the bigger that error gets, the less accurate the model is. Now just by looking at that, I can see that there's something that's not quite right here. Now, but what I can't see is how, whether it's an accuracy issue and a lot of noise, or whether it's trended and there is some pattern in those errors and the residuals. And that's important for me to look at. And if I can see that, and once I can see that, then I can know what to do next. But the fastest way and the way that every time I do any kind of regression analysis, the very first thing I look at is the residual plot and I'm just looking for is this a trend or is this just straight. And in this case, it's a bit hard to see, but it's clearly the variant is not constant. So it is clearly, it is however, we're not sure what type yet. As I mentioned earlier, what we're talking about here is when we're creating a model, which using a technique called regression, and that's trying to create a relationship between one or many input variables. So think of levers on a machine or um, input data into, a, you know, into an economics model or something like that and then we're looking at one particular output of interest to us and what we're trying to do is determine the strength and how related they are to not only single inputs but with mixtures of inputs. 
And when we do that, we can formulate a, a model, and it could be of either a model that's represented by a straight line, that would be a linear regression, or it could be a quadratic that's a, using a parabola or a, polyno a polynomial or any other curve that helps describe the data we're seeing and predictably describe, describe it. For the purposes of today, we'll look at linear, where we either have one input, and that's a linear regression, or a multivariant, or a, multi, a multiple regression, where we have many um, input variables, or x variables in this case, and each of those x variables, either singularly, or when done with combinations of them together, will give us, will, uh, allow us to predict the behavior of the system within our bounds. Moving to slide three, we talked about homoscedasticity, and that's when the error or the difference between the error u, you'll see that on the y-axis there, the vertical axis, the magnitude of those points compared to the predicted value or the predicted y, and that's the, the horizontal axis. When we have a homoscedastic system, what we find is they are, the variance is quite constant or very there's no pattern in the variance other than hovering around the predicted value. And that's actually an assumption for linear regression. Now, we want to make sure that that assumption is validated and respected, and if we do, we get to a homoscedastic system. So that's our goal. Unfortunately, moving to the next slide, being heteroscedasticity. Unfortunately, in the real world, it's not that simple. Very simple systems sometimes um, start off as homoscedastic, but typically, we have to go through some heteroscedastic um, correction procedures to get there. And that's what happens when that constant variance assumption that we're talking about it has been invalidated or violates, is violated. That condition is one that we need to do something about in some cases, in other cases it's okay. We'll get to what those are in a second. The whole point though is we want to look, we want to look at our data when we do a regression and look at the regression model and the residuals Again, the residuals are the magnitude of the error from the predicted output in the actual measured data. It tells us how good our model is or is not. We need to look at that, and we're looking for large variance, in other words, big, big differences between what the prediction is and what the actual measured was, and two, we're looking for differences in that over time or over the data set. If it's increasing, if the, re the residual error is getting bigger, as the data is getting bigger, um, that usually indicates there's a relationship. If it's just large and it's, it seems to be completely random, then we can usually work with that and call it a tolerance level or a confidence level within that particular model. Next slide, please. We're talking about, in this slide, we talk about conditional and unconditional heteroscedasticity. Again, this is what I just mentioned. The whole idea is, given that there is, we want to have a constant variance in our error, um, a relatively constant variance in our error over the whole set of data, um, that's our goal. Typically what we're going to find is, as you can see in this thing, when there's a low variance in the bottom, so when the x is small, the variance in y tends to be relatively small, the variance being the difference between the points and the prediction. But as x gets larger, that variance seems to amplify. And as that amplifies and gets bigger and bigger, that's suggesting a trend. With that trend, I can now, or at least with that visibility that there appears to be a trend there, I can now fairly safely say that this model has another factor or another X input in it that I don't know about, or is not satisfying, or there's too many in it, or there's something in it that is causing me a problem because for the regression model to be appropriate, we want that variance to stay as close to or as constant as possible all the way up that line. So it's an important con um, concept to understand. In a masterclass, we'd go through this in a lot more detail, and we'd even play around with data to do it. We don't have the time really to do that today. But the point is, we want the variance to be as constant as possible. We're aiming for homoscedastic properties. Next slide, please. Now, this, it's detecting heteroscedasticity. Now, just like anything, we can look at a graph and we can look at data from the regression, the output from the regression, and get a general idea. And that's typically what I've been doing in Six Sigma projects and any other projects where I use regression typically. However, if I do need to prove it, there is a mechanism to prove it. And that's using hypothesis testing under what's called the chi-squared 
or the chi-squared test. Now, a chi-squared distribution is a statistics distribution of variance. Okay, so if you wanted to have a look, CHI is actually the Greek letter of chi that looks like a bit like an X. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail as to what that means, except what we're trying to do is compare two variances, or three variances, or four variances, um, and then identify, do, are they the same um, when represented against the population, or are they showing something different? And that's a hypothesis test. Now, there are a number of them. You can test this with white testing. You can use um, brush pagan test. There are other scientists who are, and statisticians who have gone through and done this, and the formula is there. But typically, especially in, for the purposes of what we're talking about now, I would suggest that looking at it graphically is usually going to tell you whether you have to look further or not. Next slide, please. Now, if we find it, and in this case, let's say we have found it, there are two main methods to doing it. One is very computationally intensive, and that's robust standard errors, where we go through and um, we try to look at more data and we try to get it as close as possible with the regression model changing parameters. Or the other one is to use the generalized least squares method that actually modifies the way that the attempt is done to form the model. Generalized least squares tends to happen quite a bit. Robust standard errors is also something that's done now with statistical packages out there. Our computing power is sufficient now to be able to go through some of those things um, to make that work. Again, these are terms that you'll see. Excuse me, these are terms that you'll see um, in any time you go through these things, and it's important to know what they are. And really, all they're trying to do is to get their model to a place where the the variance is far more constant than what it was before we started. So at this point in time, I'd like to introduce an example. So Austin, would you be able to bring open up the Excel file um, that is titled? One second. Linear regression, 13th February, um, version 1.xls. And let me know when it's open, please. Um, is it called uh, linear regression 13 Feb 2013 underscore V01? Is that the one you're talking about? That's the one, yes. Yes, that's okay. the one. Okay. I've opened it's that one, one with the data for the example. Okay, historical loss data given for a portfolio of auto insurance that's exactly, policies. That's the one. All right. Yes, correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm sh what we're showing here is a set of data that's been generated um, or it's been collected over some period of time through history. It's for auto insurance company who's mm -hmm. got multiple policies. And those policies have got all sorts of things related to age, years of driving experience in vehicles, and so on. Now, for those of you who may have heard me speaking or who know about data types, there's varying different types of data types in this particular list. It's important for us to know what they are um, in business analytics in general. So we can see this in this text data, that policy number. There's some uh, discrete data being age or the number of vehicles. There's some data. From, uh, there's some binary data, or dichotomous data, being married or single, it looks like there. There's only two values in there. Fuel type looks like it's petrol or diesel, so that would be binary as well. So they also could be nominal, um, depending on if there was other types of fuel available. So I'm just trying to promote again, oh, and then there's losses data that's measured, and that measures data is actually continuous. It says it's got a continuous actual money. So I'm trying to reinforce, every time I look at data, I'm trying to understand what type of data it is so I can understand what kind of operations I can do on it when I start processing. So given we now have the data for an auto insurance company, they have a number of policies, it's spread over a large number of people, I want to start looking at the variance of what we see in losses, um, in this case it's capped losses, what we see in capped losses over different combinations of the input variables being driving experience, number of vehicles, age, married, or not married, etc. So could you switch back to the PowerPoint presentation, please? Awesome. On to the slide, multivariant uh, linear regression on age. I have uh, done it. Yeah, I am here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now what we see here is 
three age bands, one from 16 to 25, one from 26 to 59, and one over 60. And we see the average loss, and then we see the variance. Now the variance in this case is really, it's a calculated variance, it's not just the, the range, it's the calculated variance using the statistics formula. But as you can see, the, they form each one of these graphs here shows a distribution of how the losses change and increase and decrease based on age in different age groups. When I compare the three of these things together, if I put these three graphs on top of each other, I get three very different graphs. They are not the same. So visually, I've just looked at this and I've done a test on it in my home, the same test that would have been done with the BP test earlier, or very similar test, and I've done it by looking at it saying, well, it's clear that these are not forming the same overall population of data, meaning everything. So, heteroscedasticity is present. I now know that when it comes to age. Variab variance is not constant. Next slide, please. When I do the same test with gender, the two distributions, so we see the female and the males, they're similar, though um, their mean is significantly different. The average is quite shifted. The shape is similar, but they are not representing the same population, and thus we also recognize heteroscedasticity in this data. Next slide, please. Not surprisingly, if male and female doesn't make much difference, married and single probably wouldn't either. We see similar differences in variance. So once again, we've got quite a deal of heteroscedastic properties in the data we're talking about, meaning we're going to have to do some work on our models when we start doing linear regression. Finally, with, um, no, not finally, uh, vehicle age is showing very significant variances. If you look at the variance column there, it starts from zero to five, the variance in loss is up to 65,000, whereas if it's six to 10, it's nearly half, close to half that. So it's actually above, just above half that. Again, significant variance, meaning we can't just compare these as apples with apples because that's not what they are. We need to do some work on it to do some co-correction and some correction of that using some statistical techniques before we can compare them as apples with apples. The next slide, um, talking about fuel type. Well, there's basically no cor correlation at all between those, and we need to recognize the fact that we have some more work again. It's the same message as we go. So what I would like to do, of trying to point out by just showing you these graphs, is visually we can see without doing too much maths, if we did the maths, we would have got um, answers that said the same thing that I just said. I can see that from the graphs. The only time I would suggest going into the maths thing with using, a, and there's plenty of software to help you to do chi-squared um, tests. It's very, very easy to do. But the only time I'd recommend to do that is if when you're looking at it, you think it's the same, but you're not really sure, and you'd like some statistical um, uh, verification of that with a certain confidence level that you set. So moving to the next slide, please. We're now going to look at what you would do if you wanted to build this model on this data. So we're trying to, we've now taken the data, we've looked at that it's, it's got some variance, um, it's got variance issues with it. And now we're going to start creating a model and we're going to start playing around with that model to fix these problems. Now, some people on the call may have be familiar with the, the system and the language called R. R is something that's been developed predominantly by research and academics. Um, I get it from the CSIRO, um, but it's, there are mirrors all over the world, and it's quite a uh, large open source um, community for statistics and mathematical processing and modeling. It's free. It can be downloaded and installed from that URL. I have done that many times. It works fine. And it has a lot of packages that come with it. It also has a huge number of package on what's called the CRAN or the CRAN. That is the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and you can download just about anything you like. And some of the functions that we are talking about today in this presentation, you would need to download from the CRN for them to work, and I'll explain what they are shortly. R is a language. It's not real. It's not a graphical interface. It's a language where you would type in. I was actually hoping to show you that interface today, but with our WebEx issues, I'd have to show you in the classes, or your trainer would show you in a class how this works. But each thing has functions, and you need to have and functions um, and operations operate on sets of data or individual variables of data. So as you can see, L I N R E G data. That's linear regression data, meaning this is a variable that we're putting us all this data that was in that Excel file 
converted to CSV, we're putting it all into that file, into that variable or that data set so we can operate on it. And then very, very simply after that, we're doing, we're creating a variable that says, give me the regression model using the LM, LM standing for linear, linear model of capped losses when compared with and or when dealt with, that's what the tilde is, the number of vehicles and the average age and the gender dummy, in other words, the gender, and whether you're married or female. It says dummy because it needs to be converted from uh, true, false, or married, um, married or single to numbers. Then the average vehicle age, and then the fuel type dummy. And do that operation on, on the data we just read in. So what that's going to do is tell the R system to take all that data and start doing all of its regression algorithms and calculations against it, and and store the information in fit lin um, reg. That's fitted linear regression. The reason it stores it in there because we need to do some operations on it later. So next slide, please. This is multivariate linear regression using R. Now this. The first line of that slide talks about summary. Summary means give me the summary statistics of that model. Don't give me the details. Tell me what I need to know immediately to be able, or see immediately to be able to make a decision about how good this model is or is not. Now, depending on the level of statistics of the people on the call, um, some of this may or may not make sense. Just some key points to point out. Under residuals, you see minimum of minus 310.67 and a maximum of 1055.02. That is a huge difference. And what that is, is looking at the most bottom amount from the predicted values and the topmost amount from the predicted values. We can't lose minus $310. So obviously there is some issue. The 1Q and the 3Q is talking about the first quartile and the third quartile. So 50% of the data um, that was predicted from our very first attempt at the model is between minus 80 and 68, around a central point of 6.79 or 6.8. So that's just telling me there's a large range here. The very first thing I want to think about is, well, should that be like that? And I don't know yet. In a real situation, I would not know yet. I'm just thinking, okay, what is this telling me? How good is my model? And then I go through and look at each coefficient. Each of those coefficients is just like those um, in the linear regression line that I showed you earlier. It's the value in front of each x1, x2, x3. So we're forming, we're creating a, an equation, a mathematical equation for a line with many, many inputs to that line. Now the intercept is the point where that line crosses the y-axis and then the standard error is the next column. The t-value is a test statistic. We'll talk about that in the class really, it's not so important. And then the P, um, PR of greater than T, that's what that's talking about is the p-value or the test value. And each of those values except for number of vehicles is very, very small. That's saying, this is performing a hypothesis test that says, is the number of vehicles um, not relevant or relevant? Now, in this case, because all of those p's except for one is so small, we can say they are a factor, um, whereas the number of vehicles is very high, and we can say that that's questionable. So when we start optimizing our model, we'd start looking at that. Now, when I go right down to the bottom, I can see things like multiple r squared and adjusted r squared. These are percentage values, and the higher the better, depending on the accuracy of your model, but that, those values are looking high and probably reasonable. The number of degrees of freedom tells me how much data I've got. And as I can see from the, um, the final line that the F statistic, again, that's comparing um, the variance between all of these different age, married or not married, fuel types, things like that, um, on the six different tests, I can see that the p-value is also very small. Now that p-value, I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with what this is about, it talks about how good this test is or is not. I would encourage you to look it up. What that's saying is, is this data close to random? If the p-value would have been above, in this case, 0 0.05, that's just a value we choose for our confidence, being 95%. If it was above point, so 0 0.06 or 0 0.1 or something like that, we would say that the data we have 
shows random variation and thus can't be modeled. In this case, P is basically zero, very, very close to zero. That's good news for us because that says that the data we have is should be modelable with a good level of accuracy. So that's what I took away from the, all that data on here. Now, I am not in any way going to say that you should all be able to repeat this if you haven't got a background in statistics. In the master class, that two or three minutes that I just spent talking about this, we would spend much, much longer explaining what it's all about and the statistics behind it. And I'll give you plenty of references to look up later because it's not something that you do just at school. Next slide, please. Now, earlier I noticed um, that all of the different uh, things, that, all the different factors we were looking at, the X values we were looking at, um, were showing some variance issues. So one of the things that I can do to try to help me understand that is I can create a, covariant, a variance covariance matrix. And what this does is allows me to understand or at least get a better idea of what the relationships between any one of those turns out to be. So what you can see on the, on the first, in the first box up the top, there's three things, library, library, and then VC, OV, HC. They're functions that I'll explain in a second. But after that, in the results, we see intercept and then each of the variables. And on the top, we also see intercept in each of the variables. So now I can get an idea of the difference in variance from the gender dummy when compared to the married dummy by going, going starting on the left-hand side and then going across to married dummy on the right-hand side and getting that value. So R has calculated all of this for me, but for me based on, on the data. Now, that's important for me because not because I really want to read it, because I need to use it when I start doing coefficients testing and more importantly when I start doing correction. Okay? Because that information allows the model processing correction process inside the R system or an SPSS or SAS or anything else. That matrix allows it to start moving variables around to get a better model. I'm just trying to explain that it's there. You know, I'm not really going to go into much more detail about it. I mentioned earlier that you need to download packages, or you can download packages. So you'll see that there's a library for sandwich, which for sandwich estimation, and library for LM test. That's for um, for testing of linear models or using Lagrange testing. And then the third function being VC variance covariance on heteroelasticity um, uh, heteroelasticity uh, uh, constant um, constancy is what the HC stands for. Okay, they're very mathematical, scientific names. Don't worry about the names and the terms. Um, we just want to understand what we're trying to physically do here. So we're creating a matrix that we can start using to help us optimize the model, or help the system optimize the model. So once I've got all that information, I want to throw that matrix that I just calculated against the model and do some tests on the coefficients, the coefficients being the number of vehicles and things like that, to give me an idea of how much I can just change things and how different that will be, will it make the model much better? Remember I said earlier that the R squared and the R squared adjusted values were actually quite high at 75%, so I may not need to do too much. So that's the bottom half of this screen. We'll see the coefficient test or COEF test, and I'm putting in the information for the linear aggression, and I'm also referencing that VCOV HC function so to, to make sure that that matrix is fed into the new coefficients test. And when I get the results that came out of that, I still see that the number of vehicles is the only one or the only factor where the PR is very, very high. Now, given that PR is very, very high, that is saying, that is proving what's called the null hypothesis or it's supporting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the number of vehicles um, has no effect. So what I can conclude from that is I don't need the number of vehicles in my model anymore. So my model now just became one level simpler without losing any accuracy. And that's why they're saying number of vehicles is insignificant. The process by which you do this in the real world is you'll have, you'll start with the interaction. So maybe number of vehicles and average age, or all of them, whatever the combination is. And you'll eliminate them one by one until the model doesn't get any better but gets simpler, and um, those R squared and R squared adjusted values don't change too significantly. So given that I've, the coefficients have now told me, the num well, the first uh, summary told me, and then doing the coefficients test has also verified 
that the number of variables tends to be something that's insignificant, I'm going to take it out and redo the model. And all I've done is the same function previously, or all that's been done here, without the number of vehicles in the list up the top in the red line. The values came out about the same. The multiple R squared and the R squared are about the same. The P value is still very, very close to zero, making it look good. And nothing else has come up when I've redone a coefficients test. So what I have now done is increased the reliability of my model by removing um, one factor that was causing a major variance issue. Okay, So we've taken it from a heteroscedistic situation to much closer to a homoscedistic situation, and that is our goal for our model. And moving to slide 17, we see the predicted losses. We now have a, an equation that is our model equation. So once we know what true means or what male means for gender dummy, if it's one or zero, and what married dummy one or zero means, we can actually put this values into this and predict what it's going to be. That's the purpose of the model. So now we can we have an, a way to describe what we're seeing for capped losses or predicted losses based on these values of our customers and other customers that may come in within these bounds. Now the within these bounds means every line has a start point and an end point based on the data we have. We can't predict outside that because we don't have any information. It hasn't been that data has not been used to generate the model. We can only say that from the zero point to the maximum data point we have, we have got a model that is helpful. As a business analyst, if you get into this area, that is a critical point for you to understand because everyone will say, well, what if we take it way out to the limit? The answer is, and they'll say, what's better? The answer is, this model does not tell us that information. This model tells us the information within two boundaries. So if we change things and we keep our boundaries the same, we can make um, predictions with certain confidence as to what the, the net effect and net result of that would be. And that is the purpose of the model. Some of the things we can see from that model is if you, the higher the age, you have a lower of a loss, or if the older the vehicle, the lower of the losses. These are things that have come out from the model that tell us the direction that changes when you want to, say, predicted loss when set, when compared with the average age, or predicted loss when compared with the average vehicle age. If someone wanted to be very studious and have um, some fun, in, they could take that same data from Excel, they could put this equation in, put in the gender dummy and the, mar and the married dummy, being one or zero, depending on what value you choose, and look at the data that comes out, and you should see that they're relatively sim similar. If you did a, com um, a two-line plot, they should follow each other relatively closely with some oscillation around the, the line of best fit. So that brings me to the end of the multivariate linear regression. I realize there's been some statistics theory in here. There's been some stuff I haven't really been able to show it more than just say, and here is the result that comes from it. I have tried to explain it. I would ask if there are questions, please bring them up in that question time at the end. Because at this point, I'll move to, we'll move to slide 18, where we'll talk about the class, where we would do this in a lot of interactive detail. Actually, slide 19, please. So, Andrew Pristine has spent a lot of time working out how to put together a good training thing to prepare people for a, a career in business analytics or modeling or anything else. And that's called a master class. They have ones in Sydney and Melbourne scheduled for the month of February. Now that's extensive, or I sometimes call intensive classroom training. I hope I was intending over the last half an hour or 20 minutes or so to dump a lot of information to show that it is quite intense. But in a training environment with a number of people, we can ask a lot of questions, we can go through, we can try things, we can change the data with the software and see what happens. I've done that with Six Sigma training many times and I would do that here as well. So that's one part of it. The other part that's very, very helpful is all of the information, and it's slightly explained in a slightly different way sometimes as well to help complement that, is available online as part of you signing up for the course. That's very helpful and it's also very important to be able to keep referring back to that over time so you don't just get a textbook, but you get an expert in the industry who's imparting knowledge. You get access to online material to go through at your own pace. You should get some kind of textbook um, to go with that or some kind of materials to go with that, be them electronic or not. 
so you can continue to study. You also get the ability to request some one-on-one -on -one doubt clearing. So if there's areas that you're uncomfortable with and you've seen it in the online material, you want to ask the instructor or afterwards through the forums or things like that. The, the idea and the intention is if you come to a class that I'm running and it's got all of these things, a master class that I'm running or any other trainer is running, I want you to go away learning something. I want you to bring a problem with you, a doubt problem that's causing some doubt. I want us to go through it, talk as much as we can about it, depending on time, not just something that I know works. And then you can go back and you can be one step closer to your problem or more. You may have solved your problem. Or you can go back feeling, if I was presented with a problem like the one we just saw, or I could know where to start and know what to do. And the forums are a great way to get suggestions like that too. Next slide, please. And again, slide 21. So what can you do after you've done a business analytics masterclass? Where do you start? One thing that's very, very important is business analysts and these people who are skilled in business analytics and specifically around decision support and around behavioral analytics are going to influence investment decision makers. We talk about quality of things, the relevance of things, the behavior of consumers or or um, prospective consumers. They, those kind of things influence decision making. And that's why I find business analytics is a continually growing thing, a growing industry. More importantly, it is a, an industry that has informally been there for many, many years. It just hasn't necessarily had titles like business analyst or intelligence analyst or something like that, though those titles are starting to appear now in Australia and all over the world. But the key point is you're influencing decision makers about investment, you'll be influencing decision makers about strategy, you'll be influencing decision makers about cost efficiency, you'll be ensuring data collection remains there because everything you're influencing them about is based on statistical methods and is now a structured process, it is not guesswork. Many times you can look at data without thinking about the types and saying, oh, that means this, that means that means this, it's guesswork. Whereas what I'm suggesting here through business analytics is do some guesswork, do some point in time analysis, do some statistics around it to talk about and to be able to show with a good level of confidence, and I'm talking 90% plus, that the influence and the decisions and the recommendations you're making are sustainable over time. It's not luck. It looks good, it's verified, and it's statistically showing, um, it's all statistically backed up that can only increase your chance of making it a successful investment decision or cost cut or strategy or whatever that turns out to be. And with that, then you have all sorts of things about synchronizing the organization into the right area, about potential revenue increases, because you can focus on areas that are under-resourced under or eliminate them maybe um, because they're high cost or whatever it turns out to be. You're now able to use data to run your business. If you've got the skills like that and you've got a, and you can explain them, Tools like R give you the ability to create graphs and reports that explain them, so does Minitab and SAS, things like that. Then you will be moving up the food chain into those areas where you can influence those decisions and your value to any given organization or as a consultant like I have been becomes much greater. Next slide, please, slide 22. I'm oh, sorry, slide 23. The current batch of training that's scheduled over the next um, month is a class in Sydney and a class in Melbourne on the week of the 25th. It has a cost associated with the course. It's a four-day intensive class. Kiara Smith, I believe some of you would have been in touch with her already, um, has looked after me and has worked with me for some time. I'm talking probably two or three years now. And I found her to always be very responsive and very reasonable. I'm sure she will do the same for you. So if this class is of interest to you, I would suggest that um, get in touch with Kiara as soon as possible. I, don't, I do not believe the, um, the actual trainer for this class is um, decided yet. All I can say that many, many trainers, especially in Australia, are like me. We'd like you to go away with something that's good and we, to go away being able to solve real problems that you're really going to encounter. So your decision to fund the training in your mind becomes a good one. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, slide 25. I'd like to finish off before we get to questions is talking a little bit more about um, Azure Pristine, the way they set up and, and why I believe that they're a good company. And I'll touch on some points as we go through there. But the bottom line is 
they, as a training business, they're a well-established business. They have multiple certifications. They have multiple training facilities. They've done lots of training around the world, and they have a good array of types of training that they can deliver, be it classroom, video, online, or anything else. Their investors and their management team are all from very uh, well-experienced, highly regarded backgrounds. They're academics, there are people who've come from the financial industries, there's people coming from consulting industries, and they've set up a, gr a good group of teams to be able to have a, a good understanding and a good board as to how things should be running. And that really is shown when you look at the number of customers they've got, and specifically customers in the Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000. Those kind of financial customers and big customers make a lot of um, make a big deal about choosing a training provider, and I've personally touched a number of the customers that you'll see previously, not with Azure Pristine, but with other companies. So I've actually seen what kind of procedure and methodology and how they they go about doing that. And to have those names, I think, is something that is worth mentioning. It's important to also note that not only do you get training, not only do you get course materials, you'll also get models or you'll get samples that can be reused that you can take home with you. That means that Let's say that we looked at the one that was in R and we then built it in the training. You can take that home and it can be something that you can reuse as a template for anything that you wish to use. And that usually holds a lot of value for people because I don't see any reason that you're reinventing the wheel and nor does it be pristine. So we give you what we believe is a representative template. The online platform is helpful. It's always great to be able to go back and look at things. You can download new models as they update. You can look at tutorials or other things or stay in line with forums. So I would certainly encourage you to get involved just like you would at a student university or, or a technical college or something like that. You get involved with the people because how sharing information helps the learning or online that works quite well for these forums. And trainers are often monitoring them too. Next slide, please. One thing that's important is the authorizations. There are some training that you can't provide without authorization. Um, there are plenty others on, um, around the world too, but these are ones that are specifically of interest to business analytics a lot in the financial area. Um, and having that certification means that any certificate you get from Azure Pristine is recognized around the world um, because it comes with the endorsement of one of these important organizations around financial modeling, around um, any number of different things. Next slide, please. Now, some of the Fortune 500 corporates um, companies that have gone with um, Edge of Pristine for a specific kind of training, be it custom or directly um, course-based, are on this slide. Now, I have personally, in varying parts of my career over the last 20 years, touched Bank of America, Ernst & Young, JP Morgan, Mizuho. I lived in Japan for a long time, so I've had a lot of contact with them. ING in, in Amsterdam. Uh, Credit Suisse and HSBC. The only one on that slide actually is Franklin Template where I haven't personally been in touch with them. Now the reason that I say this and I want to bring this up is I have done training in HSBC. I have done training in Credit Suisse. I've done training in Mizuho, the bank. I know how particular they are. They even interview every trainer to make sure that they believe that that trainer is able to bring enough to the table to be worthy of that investment. It's not about the training material, it's about the trainer. So for Edu Pristine to have trainers and to have materials in there that has allowed them to be able to uh, quote the success of people like Bank of America, JP Morgan, Mizuho, it means that they're onto the right thing. And the truth is I'm only working with them because I believe they're onto the right thing. I like to train, I like people to go away, and I'm not going to be like some situations that I've been in when I've been asked to train everything without really having a specialization. I think the model that Edu Pristine uses that you'll see shortly is for specific topics they get people who are recognized in the field or experts in the field to explain it. So any attendee coming can ask questions and get access to a good network of contacts as a result of going to that training or someone who actually does the stuff in the industry, not someone who's just taken slides and learned how to do them. Okay. There are usually two different types. Next slide, please, number 28. Not only do, you do we deliver into large companies, we deliver into educational institutions. The only one on this slide that I personally know is the National University of Singapore. I've been to that um, campus on many occasions, and once again, they have a lot of pride in how they conduct training, both internally and for students. And as a result, having their name here is something to be proud of. 
it means that we've had to go through quite a uh, an evaluation and pre-selection, if you like, um, process to make sure that we are able to deliver according to standards that the NUS will allow to go under their name. That's an important thing to know. Next slide. Now, people all around the world can access online training, and they can also, people from around the world can access classroom training, as you've seen there. And I know of certainly plenty in the Sydney, Melbourne. There are plenty in India. Um, there are also discussions about ones in the in Dubai, in the UK, and other parts of the world. So it's a company that can actually that can actually take training to where you are, or can take training to yourself or other colleagues that you may have in other organisations or other parts of the organisation around the world. Next slide, please. Not only are they in multiple places, they are all over the world, and they are also have a large number of different topics that they can train on. Some being short, some being longer. We've been looking today at some of the basic statistics stuff about predictive modeling, and specifically the module that what I talked about today would fall under. I've done ones on data mining and modeling before, and there are a whole series of other ones in here that I'd be able to explain. But there's also a number of ones that are not really in my expertise area, and I, and I don't train them. They have another person in that area who is able to train on those things. For example, Real estate modeling is not something I'm so much into. Uh, VBA macros is not something. Whereas things like uh, wind power project modeling I could do with an engineering background, etc. Basel, Basel III is actually a uh, compliance standard out of Europe. I'm not an expert in that. So the business model is all about getting the right experts with a group of things and so they can train to a level that is beyond what's just in the training material, that is something that can really help students not only in the training, but they can contact, be in contact and part of their network as after the fact as well. So with that, um, on slide 31, I'd like to thank you. Um, I've left Kiara's details, um, both email and two phone numbers there. By all means, get in touch with Kiara. She's very helpful. I'm sure she'll be able to help you um, with education needs going forward. And from that, I'd ask um, Austin to open up for questions, please. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Richard, someone had asked previously, he said, why do we say heteroscedasticity when the profiles are similar? When the profiles are similar? Yes, that was his question. The profiles of what? I'm going to unmute him and maybe he can ask you himself. Just one minute. Sure. That would be fine. Hi, Air. Hi, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. So uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Uh, so you showed profiles of loss as a function of, um, of, of, the, of the variables. It was age or gender. And you yep. showed you showed the variation. Uh, um, yes, right. You showed different distributions uh, yes. according to age, and so uh, and so you claimed. However, you say that word again. Hetero. Um, hetero specificity. Yeah. Yeah. So that I understand, but but then what okay. I didn't understand was when you showed uh, that the profile as a function of, of gender, when it was male or female, you showed that the profiles were very similar. Uh, and, actually, no, they weren't. They weren't very similar. Their mean was probably a hundred or something different, their variance was significantly different as well. Okay, so the fact that visually the graph looked, diff looked similar doesn't reflect the fact that the variance was different. That's what you're saying? Well, the, the graph only looked similar because on a slide they were scaled. If they were on okay. the same scale, they would have been extensively different, and that's why um, it's quite clear that they were heteroscedistic. I see. Okay, that answers my question then. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you for the question. Does anyone else have any further questions? Any further questions? I hope we haven't scared them too much, Austin. I don't think we have. 
<laughs> uh, well, if no one has any further questions, maybe we can end the webinar now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for everyone for attending. I hope it was useful, and I hope um, we can take something away from this webinar and be a little inspired by regression as a modeling technique. It's actually very um, prevalent in, in industry, especially in econometrics, so, and in, in any kind of quality situation. So good luck, and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Austin. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and uh, have a good day. If you have any queries, do get back to us. You have the ID, kiara at edupristine.com. So for any queries that you have, we are here to answer you. Thank you all for coming once again. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. Can I log off now, or do I need to stay on? No, you can log off. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah. Have a nice afternoon. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.